Hello and welcome. The question for today, the question posing, I'm posing to you today is, is Neil Armstrong, is Neil Armstrong the first man to walk on the moon, the modern day Christopher Columbus? Or is he perhaps the modern day Leif Erikson? So we're going to come to that, and I'm going to give you some background for deciding. I want you to make your decision before the end of this talk, this discussion. But before we get to that, I want you to consider another question. I want you to think about this for a moment and ask yourself, what is, what has been the most important event of my lifetime? What's the biggest thing that has happened in the world during the time that I have been alive? Now, uh, depending on how old you are, that's going to you know, sort of determine the range of choices. For many of you who are about, let's say, 20 years old, it's entirely possible that the most important event of your life was something that happened um, when you were too young to remember it. For those living in the United States, it might have been the terrorist attacks of 9-11. It certainly changed America's outlook on the world. If you, well, if you were a year old at the time, let's say, or about that, you wouldn't have been able to remember what, for example, air travel was like before that, but it changed dramatically as a result of the hijacking of the airliners and the crashing of two of them into the World Trade Center in New York and one into the Pentagon in Washington. So that might very well be seen as the biggest event of your lifetimes. And it, and it gave rise to a couple of American wars in the Middle East, the war in Afghanistan, in direct response to the Al-Qaeda attack, and the war in Iraq, which, well, in the thinking of the Bush administration, the president at the time, um, was connected to it. So that might be it. Um, you might choose something else. Some of you might think it was the, the great financial recession that took place in 2008 and 2009. It certainly changed a lot of thinking about the world and, and the world economy. Uh, some of you might be thinking about the coronavirus pandemic that we're still in the middle of. And, um, you know, it's obviously a big deal. And this, this is striking in that, well, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 were a huge deal for Americans. They were much less important for people living outside the United States, but they did usher in, or at least they, they signaled, that the world was in a new age of terrorism, a, a different kind of terrorism than it had been before. So there were terrorist attacks elsewhere, then, before, and after. And so the, what Americans called the war on terrorism wasn't exclusive to America alone. So some of you, many of you watching, will not have been born in the United States, and, and you will perhaps have different views, maybe the things that happened in your home countries. Um, the, the recession of 2008, that was something that was pretty much global in effect. It hit some countries harder than others. The global pandemic, well, pandemic means an epidemic that has global reach. So the pan this pandemic is striking in that Nothing ever happened with such broad and powerful implications for the whole world so quickly. The closest precursor to the current pandemic was the, the flu, the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. It was global in its reach, but it took a lot longer for disease, for influenza, for the virus to spread around the world at that time. And so it was a, a slow motion thing. This one, this one took place within just a matter of weeks. Uh, just, it was only weeks before the first case was encountered in China, that we know about anyway, and that it was reported in other countries and then in most countries. So anyway, so those are, those are possibilities. Now, for those of you watching who are older, let's say if instead of 20 or 40 years old, you might think it was uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, you might think that it was something that happened in, maybe if you're older and from China, you might think it was the Tiananmen Square, uh, the Tiananmen Square demonstrations and uh, the brutal crushing of the demonstrations by the Chinese government that were a big deal, and maybe a big deal for your country uh, more than for other countries, but it, you know, people have different views. You might think that it was something that was not in the public well, actually, I want you to think of something in the public realm. I don't want you to think of something that happened just to you alone. But you might think of it as something of a different order. Say the invention of the iPhone in 2000, excuse me, excuse me, 2007. 
the invention of the iPhone in 2007 that really changed the nature of the way people communicate. Um, if you were older still, you might go back to the days of the early Cold War, if you're old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. That was a big deal. And that gets us in the realm of, if you're thinking of the biggest thing in your lifetime, the most important thing that happened in your lifetime, could it be a negative thing? Could it be this, uh, well, could it be the absence of World War III? So it was the, the big thing that didn't happen, I'll tell you, that if you were, so if you were 110 years old now, you would remember World War I, you would remember World War II, and you would remember that after World War I and World War II came along within a generation of each other, most people in the world thought there's probably going to be a World War III. Now we've gone a good 75 years after the end of World War II with no World War III. And so it might very well be that the biggest thing that happened in that period was the thing that didn't happen, World War III. But that, that brings up an important point in all of this because, because when we talk about uh, no World War III, if we're going to be honest, we have to say no World War III yet. It, you know, we might have World War III next month or next year, in which case uh, that would turn out to be a really big deal. Anyway, anyway, I think it's a useful exercise for people to think about, so what are the important events of their lifetime? If only to try to put perspective on your life and on the kind of things you've lived through, but also to think about sort of causation in history and how we assess the importance of events. And as you'll see, uh, well, I'm going to talk about it in a specific case. Now, I was born in 1953, so I'm not old enough to remember uh, the end of World War II or the end of World War II, but I took part in an academic conference here at the University of Texas. And it was shortly after the turn of this century. And I don't actually remember the organizing principle of the conference. I don't remember why we were called together, but there was a question that was posed to, well, I was sitting on stage with uh, another individual. I'll identify in a moment. He was a distinguished member of the aerospace engineering faculty, uh, Dr. Hans Mark. And Dr. Mark uh, was a very distinguished aerospace engineer. And he, uh, so the question that was posed to the two of us was, what was the most important event of the 20th century? So neither of us had lived through the whole century, so it was a question of, so in your view, your observation, your study of the 20th century, what do you think was the most important event? And I said, I think I, I guess I went first, and I said, um, I thought about it, because the, the question never been posed to me that way. I thought about it, and I said, okay, uh, the victory of the American side in World War II. And I reasoned that, okay, if the fascist powers had won World War II, then the world that resulted from that would have looked very different from the world that we have lived in since 1945. And I thought that was a pretty safe choice. And, you know, okay, people might have different choices, but I thought that was pretty defensible. I still think it is. Dr. Mark, he was asked the question, and he said, without hesitation, he said it was the moon landing of 1969. Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon. The first human to set foot on a body in the solar system or a body in space in the universe outside Earth. The giant leap for mankind, as Neil Armstrong put it. And I thought about that a little and I, um, so we were asked to, to comment on each other's and, and Dr. Mark commented on you know, World War II. He said, yeah, that's important and all. And I said, you know, I remembered very well the moon landing as sort of anybody of my generation would. I remember my family was vacationing at the Oregon coast. This was in July 1969. And in that particular place at that particular time, it was before cable television, so it was broadcast TV. The TV signal came out over the air. And I remember that we were watching this historic moment. The, the home that we, were, that we were renting, that we were staying in, didn't have a television. So we went to a local bar, a small town on the Oregon coast. 
um, Nesquan, and we went to a bar uh, in Nesquan, and uh, for this particular moment, they waived the rules about not allowing minors into a bar. And so we crowded around this television, and uh, because the television set was a long way from the television towers, which were 90 miles away in Portland, and the signal had to get over some mountains, the, the reception was really kind of fuzzy. It looked like snow. But we could see Neil Armstrong climb down the ladder from the lunar landing module and stick his foot on the lunar soil and kind of fumble that big line. He, he meant to say, uh, a giant leap for a man. I see, he meant to see, I blew it myself. He meant to say, a small step for a man, a giant leap for mankind. Well, he it came out a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. But, but you got the idea that one guy was taking this step, but it was a huge leap for mankind. And I understood what Dr. Mark was saying in referring to this as a really big deal. But the more I thought about it, and so you know, the more I thought about it as a historian, I began to wonder if that was so. And it started to me to seem to fall into the category of when I was referring to the absence of World War III. And we have to say the absence of World War III yet. And the reason that I thought, well, maybe this isn't such a big deal is it didn't really lead to much. It is true that other astronauts went to the moon and you know, set foot on the moon, but it didn't produce anything. And in fact, the last person to set foot on the moon was there now a good 45 years ago or so. So it's been a long time since anybody has been to the moon. And so one has to ask, okay, somebody got there, but, but so what? One of the things that students of history do is to try to sort out in the, the noise of what's happening at any given moment, what's going to have lasting importance. And I'm not sure we know what the lasting importance of the moon landing, the Neil Armstrong's giant leap for mankind was. I don't think we know yet what the importance of it, what the, the full importance of it was. And this is where we get to Christopher Columbus and Leif Erikson. So, Dr. Mark was thinking of Neil Armstrong as the modern-day Christopher Columbus, and Christopher Columbus is considered a really big deal. In the United States, we have Columbus Day. He's a hero to Italians, his native country. In New York City, there is Columbus Circle and his statues on top of a big pillar. So Columbus is the one identified with the discovery of the New World. Now, we can quibble about discovery. You know, how can you discover something where there are Hundreds of, there are millions of people, millions of humans already living there, yeah, yeah. But let, we'll call it, if you want to call it the rediscovery, that's fine. Um, but the reconnection, the connection, maybe the first connection, the connection of Europe to America in a way that had consequences almost immediately. Some devastating, some remarkable, and all of them historic. And so we know that Columbus's landing in 1492 turned out to be a big deal. And as I say, Columbus is seen as this huge figure in world history, whether you like him or you don't like him. Leif Erikson. Leif Erikson got here first. Leif Erikson and his Viking explorers and colonists landed in North America almost 500 years before Christopher Columbus. They landed in what's now Canada, in Newfoundland, and they established a colony. It's unclear how long the colony lasted there. It's unclear exactly what became of the colony. Did most of the colonists die? Did most of them go home? Why did they leave? Why, for that matter, did they come? We know almost nothing about the colony. The, it was remembered for a time in the sagas of the Vikings, the Norsemen, the modern, the precursors, the modern Scandinavians. It was remembered in sagas, but the sagas almost became like myths where you didn't know what was true and what was made up. The fact is that Neil Armstrong, oh, see, that Leif Erikson landed on sort of 
his era's equivalent of the moon, and nothing else happened. There was no follow-on, there was no second colony, and the people who came with him, and Leif Erikson went home the way the astronauts who went to the moon came home, and there didn't seem to be any second act. So, when we look back at Leif Erikson and Christopher Columbus, we can see that in the case of Christopher Columbus, what he did had world importance. In the case of Leif Erikson, it didn't have world importance. Now, the question is, why? Did it have anything to do with Columbus? Did it have anything to do with Leif Erikson, for that matter? Did the importance or comparative non-importance of the moon landing have anything to do with Neil Armstrong personally? And the answer is no. It didn't have anything to do with the accomplishment itself. The accomplishment of Neil Armstrong was a big deal. The accomplishment of Leif Erikson was a big deal. The accomplishment of Christopher Columbus was a big deal too. So what was the difference between Leif Erikson and Christopher Columbus? And then we'll maybe extrapolate to Neil Armstrong. So, as I said, the basic difference was that nothing happened, nothing of importance, nothing of earth-shaking importance happened after Leif Erikson landed in North America and the colony was withdrawn and that was that. So the question is, why not? Why didn't anything happen? Or we could put it the other way, maybe we'll deal with the two simultaneously, why did stuff happen after Columbus landed in the Western Hemisphere? So if we get to that, well, let's consider first the context of Leif Erikson's voyage. It was, as it turns out, the westernmost extent of the travels of the Norsemen, or the Vikings, we'll call them the Vikings. Um, they had been moving west from Scandinavia over the previous decades and generations. They had gone from Scandinavia, they would gotten to Iceland, they had made their way to Greenland, and they kept moving west. And they, from Greenland, they got to North America. Now, they didn't know exactly what they had gotten into. They didn't know the extent of North America. They were on Canadian shores, but they had no idea of the extent of Canada. For that matter, they had no idea of the extent of Greenland. They did know about Iceland. Iceland is relatively small. Greenland is pretty big. And so they just knew that these were landing spots in the ocean. So they didn't have any huge desire to explore things. They were hunting, they were fishing. They, so they were driven by the utilitarian desires of we got to make a living. The Norsemen had been travelers, had been raiders, in part because living in Scandinavia is not an easy task. It's the soil's thin, and so they had taken two boats. They had learned to fish, they had learned to raid, they had learned to go out in places where nobody had gone before. And they, uh, they kept hoping that the next place they were going to go was going to be more inviting, and it turned out the place they got to, Vinland, they called it, because you could, their grapes grew there, you wine grapes, you can eat the grapes, which was something you can't do in Greenland, and you can't do much in Iceland or in even Norway for that matter. So it was a pleasant land, but there wasn't anything particularly driving them from behind. They weren't being driven out of their homeland and desperate to find a new place, by the way. So when we get to when we come back to Neil Armstrong, in various science fiction movies and the like, one of the things that eventually drives the human race to colonize the moon, Mars, other galaxies, is that something in that story um, makes Earth uninhabitable. And maybe there was a nuclear war, or maybe climate change runs away, or something like that. So one of the things that makes people head out is something is pushing them from behind. They, they have to leave. It's not just, oh, let's take a nice voyage out here. In the case of Leif Erikson, okay, um, he was a relatively well-off guy. So he wasn't being driven by poverty or anything like that, nor were the people who traveled with him being spurred by religious persecution. Uh, nobody was compelling them to go. So they went, as I say, they had a nice exploration, they founded this colony, but it's not as though they had to stay here, make it or bust. And being a long way from home, is often a hard thing. One, one principle of successful colonization is you almost always have to have some follow-on support from home. And Leif Erikson and his colonists were at the end of a long 
supply chain. And given the bad weather in that part of the North Atlantic, it's almost certain that they had problems with supply. It's also expensive. Somebody has to put up the money. And it's unclear where the money came from and maybe the money dried up. The other thing is, one of the things that compels people to travel, to go exploring, as I say, with Lee Erikson and the Vikings, it didn't look like they were you know, driven really to explore. They're kind of curious, but there wasn't some place they really wanted to get, they really needed to get. Explorers often are looking for something that is tugging them forward. In various times, they'll be looking for gold. In the case of Christopher Columbus, he was looking for a short passage to the Indies. He was driven by, we'll call it the profit motive. He understood that if he could find a shorter, swifter route to the Indies, by which he meant what we consider India, Indonesia, China, sometimes Cathay, um, then he would be able to short circuit the monopoly that various merchants already had on the spice trade, the silk trade, the trade in luxury goods. And Spain would benefit from this, and Christopher Columbus, having been hired as a, an admiral by Spain, would benefit personally from this as well. So what he was looking for, he really had this desire to get to some place. Now, it turns out he had no idea that there was this big chain of two continents standing in the way. That was one of his misapprehensions. But the reason he went out was he wasn't looking for a new world. He was looking for something, we'll call it China. He was trying to get to China. He bumped into this new world, but that, he had no particular desire to stop there. And in fact, the explorations went on. And for decades, and then even centuries, people, ban people began looking for a water passage through North and South America to figure out how to get that shorter water route to China. As it turned out, within about 40 years after Columbus landing in the West Indies for the first time, uh, the Spanish explorer Magellan uh, managed to make it to uh, go around South America and into the Pacific. So they did find the water route, but it was around South America. Um, so, so Columbus had this incentive to go, but there was another thing. He lived in a different time. He lived in a time where the mindset was, was very different, where the minds of, I'll call it the minds of Europe, maybe I could call it the collective mind, where the collective mind of Europe was open to new ideas, open to new places, open to new things. Leif Erikson lived sort of amid the early, well, the Middle Ages, sometimes called the Dark Ages. It was an age where people had lost the questioning spirit of antiquity when science was largely shrouded in religious faith and superstition, when people didn't believe that the, the secrets of the world, of the universe, could be unlocked by human reason, questioning, exploration. Columbus had the advantage to live after the onset of the Renaissance, the time when people began to ask exactly these questions. He also had the advantage of knowing that there was something beyond that new world that he found. He knew about China. He had read the writings of Marco Polo. He had heard of travelers who had been to the Indies. He had, he had used the stuff that came from the Indies. He knew about the silk. He'd seen the silk. He had eaten food spiced with the spices. So there was something beyond there. And so he had reason to go out across the ocean. Furthermore, he knew um, flat earthers of his time, and there weren't very many, they were very uneducated people who believed that the earth was flat. He knew that you could get around the world by you know, going the wrong direction. And so he had, this, he had this reason to go. In fact, when he got to the West Indies on the first voyage, he came home. And he showed, okay, I've discovered, well, he thought he was in the Indies. He thought he was in undiscovered islands close to the Indies, which is why the natives of the Americas, the native peoples of Americas were and still are called Indians. He thought these were the Indies. Now later he had to, later these turned out to be the West Indies, but Columbus made three more voyages to the Americas and never quite realized that he had discovered this new continent, these new continents. And he thought that he was still kind of on the edge of the Indies. But the main difference between Leif Erikson and Christopher Columbus was that by the time Christopher Columbus got to the West Indies, Europe was ready to discover, and this is a key, 
exploit this new world. There were sailing ships that could circumnavigate the globe that were much more seaworthy over long distances than the long ships of the Vikings. So the technology existed. The infrastructure existed. So there were markets to sell whatever products could come from the Indies. The, the Vikings had, you know, there was nothing that they were intending to exploit and they didn't find anything in America that they could exploit. But, but furthermore, their mindset, their whole society, their political economy wasn't set up for this sort of thing. One of the consequences of the Renaissance was the emergence of something approximating a modern capitalist economy. It's, it's still in its rudimentary form, but the idea that merchants could make a bunch of money if they could get ships to India and to China and get a hold of those goods there and bring them home. So there was that. There was also this idea that the human mind, the human mind can uncover the secrets of the world. It also helped that there was a, an ardent competition going on between the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Portuguese had made it to the Indies going around Africa and the Spanish knew where they wanted to get to and so they were just taking this different route. But the upshot of all of this was, and the thing that made Columbus important, was not simply the discovery of the New World, because again, uh, Leif Erikson had got there five centuries before, and of course there were humans already there even at the time Leif Erikson was there. The, the more important, the greater importance of Columbus's voyage was what happened afterwards, what it led to. And this depended not on Columbus himself, but on the context in which it took place. So if there hadn't been those five centuries of history, of development, between, between Leif Erikson and Christopher Columbus, then Columbus's discovery wouldn't have been that big a deal either. But they were, and he did become a big deal. Which brings us back to Neil Armstrong. So, as I said, humans went to the moon in the late 1960s. They returned in the early 1970s. But the moon has been a quiet place, as far as human beings are concerned, for, well, for more than 40 years. There is talk nowadays, a uh, return to the moon. The Chinese appear to have a lunar program underway, and President Trump has himself talked about Americans going back to the moon and then going beyond the moon to Mars. Now, talk is cheap, and so we will see if anything comes of it. And it will be really interesting if it does occur. If it does occur, it's probably going to occur during, well, many of your lifetime, uh, perhaps, probably, in my lifetime, I suppose. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see if it turns out to be a bigger deal this time around than it did the first time around. Is there any greater reason to go to the moon than there was back then? I'd suggest that maybe not. Maybe even less reason. Various people who are interested in space and space exploration, that sort of thing, have pointed out that putting humans in space is really expensive compared to the scientific payoff. That it's a lot cheaper to put instruments in orbit. So if you want to know more about the moon, send robots to the moon. Even if, let's suppose that minerals, valuable minerals are found on the moon, send robots to dig the minerals. When you add humans into the equation, you require all sorts of extra stuff to keep them safe, to build redundancy in. It's disappointing to lose a space probe. It's tragic to lose human lives, especially if you don't have to. And so, I don't know. Uh, some people have said, some people did say, at the time that Armstrong landed on the moon, that, well, humans have to go there because humans are curious and humans have to, to be there. And they would draw the connection to Christopher Columbus. They rarely drew the connection to Leif Erikson, but they would draw the connection to Christopher Columbus, and that was the big deal. But it was a different time, because in 1492, in the early 1500s, to get anything out of a new discovery, you had to send people there. It might very well be that going to the moon is simply, well, what some people said about the first moon projects. It's really a publicity stunt. 
It, um, it originated in America's competition with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. There's no Cold War going on, but maybe it might turn out. Well, maybe there's a new Cold War going on. And this, it might be an aspect of American competition with China. I suspect that one of the reasons that China wants to do it is to show that it can do what America hasn't done for by then probably half a century. So there is prestige on the line here. But, but this sort of raises the question, you know, once they've got there, what are they going to do? Maybe, maybe it turns out that Neil Armstrong, well, so let's just suppose that they do make something of it, and it turns out to be a big deal, then when history books are written 300 years from now, people are going to ask, so who was the first human to land on the moon? And they will have to say it's Neil Armstrong. And so at that point, Neil Armstrong really will be the new Christopher Columbus. But maybe, maybe it turns out that this one is no, this moon landing this time around, moon exploration this time around, is no bigger a deal, at least no bigger deal for humans. Maybe robots do the whole thing. In which case, Neil Armstrong might be, I don't know, will he even be considered um, Leif Erikson? I don't know. Um, this is something that, uh, I mean, I can't even say with confidence we're going to know within the next 10 years, the next 30 years, the next 40 years. One of the things about history is, um, you know, it's almost always too soon to tell for sure the importance of things. That's all for today. Thanks.